you. little apology for the late commencement. Um, I think I must have got the bus times wrong. I was out at 5-2 uh, at the hotel when it was said, but it uh, left about 15 minutes, and then we all know about the traffic here. But apparently there was one a little earlier. I'm sorry. Well, never mind. We are here now, and I welcome you to this uh, session on online dispute resolution. Um, this, um, there was one in Hyderabad in 2009. I don't know if anybody attended that. And um, so in a sense, this is a follow-on. A lot has happened in this field of online dispute resolution since then. And I would like, however, just to um, set the scene with some background uh, and a few slides uh, for those who may not have been involved in the development and discussions of online dispute resolution over the years. Um, and at the same time, there's a number of issues that we've started to um, list out that, in fact, will uh, arise. Um, and I really want this to be a discussion of those issues and welcome the thoughts from you all and any contributions anyone wishes to make about those issues. Um, if I can just very briefly start uh, with this, um, start the slideshow. with this comment uh, that was made by Professor Richard Suskind, who was the IT advisor. Oh, I see. Okay, so I need to, I'm discussing it, I'm changing it here, fine, thank you. So, slide two, please. Okay, Professor Suskind is, and has been for a number of years, the IT advisor to the Lord Chief Justice in the UK, and uh, at the fifth forum of International Forum on Online Dispute Resolution um, that was held at the University of Liverpool in 2007, he made this comment that uh, he believed ODR has the potential um, to significantly uh, change the way uh, lawyers operate. Um, that's, that, that's a view. Now, um, there is a website for those who don't know. Uh, next slide, please. ODR.info, run by uh, the National Center for Technology and Dispute Resolution at the University of Massachusetts, and this is a, a must-go-to site for all information on ODR. Um, next slide. Um, I've done here a very brief timeline, again, just to show to people what has been happening over the years. It was in 2002 that um, uh, Professor Ethan Cash of the NCTDR in UMass in discussions with somebody from uh, Daiwan Choi of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, uh, it was agreed to form the International Forum on ODR. That was held at the Palais des Nations in 2002, in Geneva, and again in 2003. And um, it then uh, continued, and I'm pleased to say each year since, all, all around the world, uh, most recently this year in Prague, and next year, next June, in Montreal. So again, I urge anyone who uh, is interested in this subject, hopefully by attending today, if you're not already aware of the forums, to uh, uh, by all means see if you can attend them. Uh, and many of the forums, the websites are still up there, certainly from Liverpool. I know a lot of the presentations and videos, including Richard Suskind's, is still up there. Um, in 08, um, the European, uh, European Committee for Standardization workshop agreement was formed. Um, I was a member of that committee on ODR standards and, uh, and an ODR taxonomy that is on the, uh, available in the European Library. In um, 2010, UNCITRAL, the United Nations Commission for International Trade Law, set up a working group on ODR, which uh, unfortunately is having, I think, its fifth meeting this very week that we are here in Baku. And so many people interested in ODR have, have, have had to make a decision of which event to attend. I'll be saying something, or will be somebody will be saying something, I think, about that, what their sessions. And also in that year, um, an EU-funded project called MCOD was set up, which is now reported. Um, I've been a member of that team. And it was to uh, uh, look at the issue of 
if ODR then is being provided, how do we assess the quality of the system and user experience? And that has now re been reported. Um, in 2011, the European Union proposed uh, um, a regulation on ODR, which is due to go in its final form to the European Parliament in January. The latest news is sometime towards the end of January next year. That is connected with a new directive on ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution. So as you see, a lot is happening, looking at standards, looking at norms and rules that can be developed for this subject. We'll hear more of that today and a lot of the issues that that will raise. Um, there's the uh, regulation. Um, I've just heard from um, the UK government representative uh, dealing with the EU's ADR directive and regulation through this email, which I can very briefly share. It was a general round robin email to say that there's been some delay with the uh, directive and the regulation. There's been some amendments um, being proposed um, that whilst it originally was intended to cover cross-border consumer transactions, that it perhaps should be extended to uh, um, domestic transactions. Um, and also um, that whilst in its original form was to cover um, disputes that consumers would have on the trader, um, there's a call for this to also extend to cover disputes that a trader might have against the um, consumer. And I, I'm just showing you a, uh, a, oh sorry, I haven't been asking us to get through. If you can come up again, move on a bit. I didn't, that's the email, but if you just move on to the next slide, please. Um, I'm just showing you a, a website that has driven the view of extending the regulation to claims that traders have on uh, consumers because of the growth, because of the growth on the internet of consumer reviews. And this has produced not just fairly balanced websites that allow positive and negative consumer reviews, which is a good initiative in development of the internet uh, and in consumer uh, rights and power, um, but there are now sites like Ripoff Report, which as its name suggests, is not really interested in positive reviews uh, on products, but quite the reverse. And um, has caused, and I know I have detail, I won't go into it, but I can talk privately to people if they're interested, ha has caused this problem, not just Ripoff Report, for other similar websites, has caused problems for traders because a lot of these reviews are now being aggregated um, by sites by like Google Seller, for example, will have anyone's reviews will be taken into account in their algorithms for aggregate Google Seller ratings. And the accumulation of these reviews can indeed eventually have some impact on the amount of business that traders do. So were these reviews are totally wrong, untrue, defamatory, etc., there should be some uh, resolution, some that uh, some uh, solutions for the traders, and that's one of the drivers to the view by some, uh, myself included, that the ODR regulation being issued by the European Union should extend to cover claims by traders. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, that's just showing you the uh, website there available, which I mentioned for the forum in Prague, and there's the one for MCOD, there's the one for Encitral, um, I understand they're very much, although they've had five meetings, they're very much at the early parts of discussing standards for ODR providers um, and systems, and they haven't yet reached those outcomes. One of the issues there is about where ODR being binding or non-binding, and we'll hopefully discuss that this morning. Um, there is a, a, a book called Online Dispute Resolution Theory and Practice. People might like to, if they want to get an update on the subject, it's very extensive. A lot of the experts and people who've been speaking on the subject for the last 10 years uh, have contributed to that. Um, there is uh, the publisher's site showing the price, but I'm pleased to say if you go to 
um, my company site, modria.com, mod, uh, modria.com, and go to the blog, you'll see a link where it's now available f for a free download. So the whole of this very thick book and series of articles on ODR is available now, currently, we're not sure for how long, legitimately, I should add, uh, for free download, for anyone here can take. Uh, you go to modria.com, M-O-D-R-I-A.com, click the blog, and you'll see it listed there. Um, again, every year there is an event called Cyber Week, which this year occurred last week, uh, an online discussion, set of discussions, um, adrhub.com, all those discussions on, on ODR are still available. Sorry, if you can go forward again, please. I'll get the hang of this. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, I keep clicking here, thinking the uh, display is coming up. And again, please, that's the book. That's the Modria blog page. And that's the Cyber Week page, particularly dealing with the European ODR initiative. Um, I think uh, one of our speakers, Colin Rule, will talk a little bit more about Modria, but a lot of the ODR at the present is, a for is in the form of online mediation. And there's an example of the, if you go forward, please. There's an example of seeing here of the um, online mediation platform that Modria operates, where the uh, where mediator can have his discussions separately with all the parties. But what I want to say is looking, and if you can go forward again, please. Um, and forward again, please. We'll see more about that. Um, that um, and forward again, I think. That in fact, um, beyond that, what a number of people are working on in the future, exciting future of ODR, which we at Modio are actually also involved in and developing at the present time, is what we call technology facilitator resolution. You may hear something about that, but where you go beyond discussions, asynchronous discussions, and deal, for example, with, and this is the excitement of technology, case profiling so that the software can become a neutral advisor um, to empower disputants so that they can better self-analyze their dispute and therefore improve and increase the ability of parties in dispute to resolve themselves. You can have automated suggested solutions. You'll be hearing from... Uh, um, uh, Professor Zelesnikov today about game theory um, systems that he's working on that help parties to focus on their real needs. Uh, some of you may have may know of blind bidding systems, one of the earliest forms of uh, ODR. Um, anonymous brainstorming where people can have discussions without being identified which party they are in, which side of the dispute they are in. One could even have a damages database, as you know, in the law, we, we try to assess the level of claims and the valuation by precedent and reported decisions. But the reported decisions that go through the courts are very few and far between. Uh, you could, in fact, build up anonymized databases of settlements that don't breach any confidentiality or privacy, but help, um, help create knowledge uh, on, what, on the sort of values that people find are fair for particular types of dispute. And let's, let's look at ODR as building a fair global justice system, primarily outside of the courts with all the um, uh, barriers uh, uh, of cost and delay um, uh, and involvement of gatekeepers that that involves. So there you are, brief introduction for those people who perhaps may be new to the subject. I'm going to ask for my, my uh, first panelist to give her pres presentation. Um, uh, um, this is uh, Professor Hong Xu and, um, uh, from the School of Law at Beijing Normal University. Sorry, Professor. No, I this is Professor Xu who yeah, is here Yeah, I just wanted now. to make clear that uh, we also have uh, uh, four other remote panelists, uh, Colin Rule, uh, John Zeleznowski, uh, Alberto, and Ijeoma. They are already on the platform. Thank you. And uh, whenever you want to give them the floor, that you can give them the floor. I will, okay. I will do Thank that. Thank you very much. I think, I think Hong needs to get off first, so I've allowed her to, to speak first. Hong. 
Thank you, Barham. Uh, thank you for organizing this very interesting workshop. This, I'm, I'm sure this is a, a great job um, to stimulate online dispute resolution, and it's a uh, very nice follow-up to our Hyderabad IGF ODR working group. I was the organizer of the Hyderabad ODR working group, and Grantham kindly gave a presentation in Hyderabad remotely, I guess. <laughs> and I, I guess it's very nice. We use the remote participation for this online dispute resolution workshop um, because it's, it's exactly the point for resolve uh, the issue through the technology. Uh, well, this Grantham just gracefully gave a briefing what is happening and on Citro working group and uh, an EU, uh, especially the uh, ODR initiative uh, through the regulations, and hopefully it will be incorporated into the ADR directive. I, I have a little briefing from Asia Pacific, um, and in. Uh, in Asia Pacific, uh, there is a United Nations uh, Economic and Social Committee uh, for uh, Asia Pacific, a UNSCAP. UNSCAP is now uh, drafting a regional treaty for paperless trade. And in this um, uh, new uh, treaty, it addressed the issue of online dispute resolution. So I guess this is something uh, pretty new. Uh, of course, this is a, a draft treaty. It will go through the membership, uh, uh, the member state uh, consultation. And uh, UNSCAP set up a um, United Nations paperless trade expert network. Uh, and, uh, it's called UN, uh, UNEXT. Uh, and I'm on the UNEXT advisory uh, committee. Uh, th uh, this committee uh, is uh, uh, researching uh, all kind of uh, paperless trade issues, uh, not only uh, the electronic transaction of data and documents, uh, but also the personal data protection, consumer protection, and uh, the last but not least, online dispute resolution. So it seems uh, not only in Europe, but also in Asia Pacific, this um, uh, online dispute resolution mechanism is developing uh, very rapidly. Oh, and, um, as uh, Graham has just talked about, ODR is much more than use of technology to resolve disputes. It's about building justice on the internet. Um, so um, actually, I do not want to emphasize the O. Oh, of course, it's online. Internet is a great facilitation tool. But what is the focus? It's dispute resolution. Probably we reverse the sequence. It's dispute resolution for the internet or on the internet. What I want to present is from another perspective. We talk about e-commerce, this uh, dispute resolution for trade on the internet. Of course, this is important, very, very important part. But we need to look at the other part. That is the accountability uh, and the governance mechanism building uh, on the internet. And what is role can online dispute resolution play in this new building up system? Uh, the same the uh, dispute resolution could be a very important mechanism to establish this kind of a global accountability for internet governance. Uh, and, and on the internet where there's no uh, country borders, is boundary, and who is accountable uh, to the people who is uh, using this uh, great platform for uh, all kind of wonderful things for trade, uh, very, for very communication, important. for expression, for creation. And uh, I can give you an, a short example. What is happening uh, in ICANN is a domain name organization taking care of an assignment of domain names and numbers. Uh, they are establishing is dispute resolution system. It's called independent review panel. Uh, this is to um, adjudicate the dispute between the ICANN community and its decisions. So it's interesting. ICANN is not a treaty organization. I, it is non-profit uh, organization registered in California. It is subject to California state law. But it's actually managing domain name. It's a global system. So it seems it's global uh, coverage through this technical system need a global accountable system. Uh, but there's no uh, sovereign states law can reasonably address this issue. So they're building this dispute resolution uh, as a kind of online court, a tribunal to make decisions. I, I think this is very much interesting development for uh, dispute resolution on the internet. And I, I use um, uh, the second half of my time to talk about what is happening in China right now. Um, 
uh, uh, China is now uh, drafting a new law. It's called Internet Retail Regulations. Uh, the drafting has been going on for an, uh, one and a half years. It's almost two years. It's a slightly delayed because of the uh, power transfer <laughs> is going on right now. Uh, this regulation will be quite comprehensive. It will address all aspects of uh, retailing on the internet. Um, so it's uh, not about this uh, bulk sell. It's only to this uh, B two C to consumers. It covers the market access on whether you need to apply a license to have this uh, internet retailing services, uh, consumer protection, personal data protection, uh, intellectual property protection is uh, very much a comprehensive uh, legal documents. It's now at the state council and hopefully could be proved sometime next year. <laughs> Um, and in this very interesting drafting bill, um, there is one provision, a specific address, the third party transactional providers, is something like eBay or in China called Alibaba or Tmall. These are very big online transaction platform providers. It means it's a, a, a tens of thousands of traders are using their platform to selling goods, providing services to consumers. Uh, so the focus of this draft bill is to regulate these third party uh, 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 platforms. They believe this is really the nuxus of uh, internet retailing. Uh, one of the requirements for this uh, third party transactional platform is to set up online dispute resolution mechanism. But of course, this is a very much an open clause. Uh, the, uh, the provider can set up whatever uh, ODR process they deemed appropriate. It could be a kind of um, self-deciding process. Uh, it's a consumer file a complaint and they may respond online. It could be adjudicated by third party or mediated by third party. So it could be uh, using the third party service to resolve the dispute. It could either be in the form of uh, negotiation, mediation, or arbitration. And with respect to enforcement, it could either be enforced uh, internally, such as all the traders submitted guarantee uh, to the platform, such as to, to, to Taobao, <laughs> uh, the Timor, uh, they have the guarantee money stored there. If this kind of a uh, consumer rights breach, then the Timor can actually deduct from the guarantee money. It can also be enforced through court order. So decision is being made, but it's not enforced internally. You need to apply for the court, and the court made the order to enforce the decision. So it's very much uh, an open uh, system. And finally, uh, Graham just mentioned the, the, the rewills or this uh, assessment submitted by consumers. I guess <laughs> this is very much interesting. It is not, it's, it's happening in China right now. Uh, like Timor, I guess, world largest uh, uh, B2C platform, and all the consumers can submit their rewills assessment uh, online to traders. Um, they, that the trader's credit will very much be determined by these rewills. Uh, this is very much about the market and the future of these traders is important for them. And some people just um, submit bad rewills in bad things. Even though they receive good services in group, they, they just don't like the trader or just behave bad. Uh, in that case, uh, uh, currently this regulation cannot address because the dispute resolution is presented in the draft bill. It's only to address the consumer's complaint, not the trader's complaint. For the trader's complaint, I guess it, it should be subject to another dispute resolution process, uh, hopefully set up by the platform. Um, and so um, uh, this is what I want to brief. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to respond if there's any question. Uh, Graham, so thank you. Uh, th thank, thank you, Hong. Is there any questions from the uh, audience there? No, can I just uh, perhaps, I know you've got to get off very quickly, on, uh, Hong, and just um, uh, ask you about whether it, if there is to be any um, inclusion in the debate on the regulations in China of um, 
consumer reviews, as you say, particularly in view of the impact, quite interesting that you're mentioning on actually the payment they receive, which is uh, quite an exciting opportunity, um, the, as to the question of the incidence, not just of consumers wanting to give a bad comment, but of worst examples of uh, yes. uh, cons com companies getting people to oh, yeah. comment against a competitor adversely, right, right, right. or a, the other side of the coin, a false positive review. Right. Oh, thank you very much, Graham. Now, this is a big issue. It's also happening in China. Uh, I guess that for those people who are submitted as a proxy of certain company, they're not real consumers. So this is a fraudulent comments, and, and I guess for that part, they should subject to the legal proceeding. It could be uh, uh, this is a damage to the company's reputation rise, um, yeah. but it would take a long time. <laughs> so right. in okay, thank you, Hong. I know you have to get off. and. This will now be a t almost a totally online presentation. So we've got quite a few people lined up here. And I want to um, now, if we can bring in Colin Rule, our first presenter. Uh, Colin had, like a few, had intended to be here, but unfortunately circumstances uh, prevented that. Colin, um, is there a connection? Colin has uh, worked in the dispute resolution field for more than 20 years as a mediator, trainer, and consultant. Um, he, uh, for over 10 years, he um, uh, set up and ran and was the head of online dispute resolution at eBay and PayPal. Uh, and uh, more recently, um, is running a spin-off from eBay and PayPal, which I'm uh, called Modra, uh, and uh, in California. And Colin uh, is really someone who, more than anyone, has been out there and, in fact, been doing it and been looking not at the uh, theory of ODR and what is possible, but actually what is happening and coming across all the problems and issues that arise. Colin, can I introduce you? And perhaps you'd like to give your presentation and then we can have a discussion on issues that you find uh, uh, Absolutely. relevant. Absolutely. Thank Colin. you, Graham. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can. Yes, Thank you. we can. Great. Well, I'm delighted to be uh, with you all virtually, but I'm dismayed that I'm not there with you in person because I would have very much liked to have been there in Baku with all of you to shake your hands and be in the room. But I think uh, actually it's perfectly appropriate as part of IGF and uh, online dispute resolution to be participating remotely. So I see my slides are up here. Uh, uh, Graham, how long how long do you want me to take for, uh, uh, for this presentation? Well, I think, um, say, no more than 10 minutes. Okay, sounds good. So why don't Co I click Colin, Colin, we lost I your video. Oh, you lost my video. Hmm, okay, I should be back now. Uh, you don't need to see my, my pretty face. You can probably get an idea of uh, what I look like, but here I am, I'm back. Okay, so let's just dive ahead, because uh, I've got a couple slides, and I'm eager to get to the Q&A with everyone. And I think uh, Graham and Hong have done an excellent job laying things out. You know, online dispute resolution writ large is the use of information and communications technologies to help people resolve their issues. Um, I think Graham went through a lot of this, ODR.info and the ODR forums and the new book, Online Dispute Resolution Theory and Practice. I will point out that uh, ADR Cyber Week, which is a global conference in online dispute resolution, just ended on November 2nd, and you can access it at ADRhub.com. There's a lot of great conversations there. But uh, online dispute resolution is evolving rapidly, and it is very global, as you can see from this presentation. And I'm sure John and Alberto will elaborate on that point as well. So in online dispute resolution, there are a variety of techniques that we use, everything from what Graham described as technology-facilitated resolution, software-only mechanisms for resolving disputes, up to manual processes like mediation and arbitration. So uh, I won't show you examples of all of these things, but um, you can see on this slide, and Graham had this slide as well, MODRIA stands for Modular Online Dispute Resolution. So what we've done is built software that can handle all of those different types of online dispute resolution, from problem diagnosis to uh, direct automated negotiation to mediation and then to arbitration. And each of these modules can click together like Legos, so we can build appropriate resolution flows for each kind of dispute. Um, and you can see that each module acts kind of like a filter. So the internet is generating tens if not hundreds of millions of disputes a day. It's not possible for us to resolve all of these disputes manually with human response. 
So what we did at eBay and what we're trying to do uh, currently in, in uh, building these global ODR systems, you can see there's a large volume of incoming cases. If we can use TFR, like problem diagnosis and negotiation, to resolve the majority of those cases, then we can reduce the remaining volume down to a trickle that is manageable with, with human support. So uh, let me talk for a minute about eBay and PayPal. Um, as, as I think Graham mentioned, we, we resolve more than 60 million disputes a year at eBay in 16 different languages. 90% of those cases are resolved entirely in software, so only 6 million of those have to be touched by a person. And a majority of those cases are resolved amicably, which means uh, most of the disputes that are on eBay are generated by misunderstandings, not bad guys. So uh, we have 250 million uh, registered users at eBay. If you counted them up as citizens, I think we'd be the fifth largest country in the world. But if you look at sites uh, like Skype or like Facebook, uh, they're almost up at a billion users. So uh, very quickly, we're, we're getting up to some very high numbers. Um, eBay, I think, has been out front on online dispute resolution because its role is somewhat unique. It was one of the first global marketplaces. Uh, I know Hong mentioned Alibaba and some others in the Chinese context, so now there are marketplaces all around the world. But uh, these marketplaces don't buy or sell anything. They never see the item in question. So eBay in the early days saw its role as kind of the referee, and uh, they would separate uh, the buyer and the seller whenever there was a problem. But now what eBay tries to do is act as the convener and bring the buyer and seller together to work the problem out themselves. So you can see on the next slide, slide 10, this is the PayPal Resolution Center. Both eBay and PayPal provide resolution centers for every single user on the site. And uh, they can come to the resolution center, they can report a problem by clicking that orange button, uh, or they can respond to a problem that was filed by someone else involving them. So this makes it very easy for problems to get resolved very quickly so that people can get back to doing business. Um, and I won't dwell too much on this, but we were able to do some very extensive studies of eBay and PayPal activity, and what we found is that users that use these dispute resolution processes were far more loyal and far more likely to use uh, eBay and PayPal moving forward versus people who did not file a dispute. What you can see there is the blue line shows the reactivation rate for users that filed a dispute, about 114 percent, and the, the red line there is for users that did not file a dispute, and their reactivation rate is about 108 percent. So you can see, uh, especially when the dispute is resolved amicably, the reactivation rate is much higher. So that's why it's so important to invest in these types of mechanisms to accelerate e global e-commerce. So I won't spend too much time talking about the Modria platform. You can explore it yourself. We've got free demos that are available. Um, and on the arbitration flows and the mediation flows and our technology facilitated resolution flows. But, uh, and Modria is not the only platform in the world. There are other great online dispute resolution systems like Jurapax.com that you can go and explore. Alberto and John both have platforms that they've built as well. So uh, I urge you to check it out if you'd like to learn more. We've integrated uh, payments. We've integrated caucusing, we've integrated video conferencing, actually we use WebEx, the same technology that we're using here for this meeting, so uh, it's all very streamlined and very secure. Um, and I think Graham also mentioned the UNCITRA working group and the EU regulation, Hong mentioned this coming law in China, which has been worked on, and I'd also like to mention in British Columbia and Canada, they recently pr pr passed a, a regulation that also calls for the integration of online dispute resolution into the court system to handle low dollar value civil cases. So, uh, and I won't go into this design either, but this is the design that we put together for the UNCITRAL ODR working group that would enable all of these different ODR providers around the world to cooperate and enter their cases into a global case database, which would allow for cross-border, cross-language dispute resolution. So the technology is getting very sophisticated, and all of it resides in the cloud. So I guess the long and the short of what I'd like to say is that online dispute resolution is, is a key piece of infrastructure for the Internet. Much like in face-to-face -face -face societies, we've got to guarantee justice. And you see every society around the world has created courts and created justice to ensure that fair resolutions can be delivered. We need the same functionality online. But the old model of the way justice systems work simply will not work online. You have to use online dispute resolution because it crosses borders and because it crosses jurisdictions. Uh, we say there is no A in ODR, meaning it's not an alternative. Uh, ADR stands for alternative dispute resolution. But uh, there, it's not an alternative. Online dispute resolution is really the only way we can solve these growing global disputes. 
And the interesting thing is, alternative dispute resolution started very local on the grassroots level, and then it, it merged uh, uh, and, 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 and uh, handled disputes that were cross-border or uh, uh, were not in the same geographic area. Online dispute resolution is working in the opposite direction. So online dispute resolution actually is starting out global. So that's why it's so appropriate to be talking about this during the IGF, because we're dealing with cross-border, high-volume, high low-value cases. That's our focus. Uh, and we are moving also from online-only cases to now offline cases. And we see a lot of cases like insurance issues and divorces are also being dealt with online. So the long and the short of it is the final bullet here. I think that ODR is an essential component of global Internet governance. We have now 10 years of experience at sites like eBay and PayPal and through ICANN, so we know how to do ODR well. So I strongly urge all of the delegates at the IGF to learn more about ODR and make sure that it's a, a key component of our inter Internet infrastructure as we move forward. So this is my contact information, and there's a place where you can get a demo of the Modria platform. And with that, I will turn it back to Graham. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Colin, for that. And just before I, I open it to, to, the, to the group for questions, if I can just re ask you one, one question. The, um, sure. You've made it clear that, the, helpfully, that one of the drivers to all this is um, that whilst technology has suddenly enabled cross-border trade or uh, to, to rocket and to, to, to have no barriers, uh, the legal systems that are there to resolve disputes uh, are still very much jurisdictionally based and have all those barriers. And no matter how sure. much we try to harmonize laws, um, it'll never ever, uh, we never are going to have a, 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 a global law in our lifetime. And therefore, and apart from the legal systems, there are also in any event in the legal system, the, the barriers of cost and delay. So there is this need for, for that. And I'm wondering to what extent you feel, therefore, that ODR generally will, um, uh, will therefore show some benefit in that. The EU say that one of the drivers for their regulation is that the single market hasn't worked as yet. The single market meaning people are not buying from other EU countries as they are should do or what the, 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 the encouragement is. They still buy largely from traders in their own country and that raises issues of trust in who they're buying from. Um, and Absolutely. Uh, and they're bringing out the regulation tr to try to help and encourage that trust and provide um, knowledge and trust that there will be a, a simple, cheap resolution system. So do you feel that beyond the EU and generally, that is one of the great deliverables of the whole area of ODR? And how yeah, Graham, you, you put your finger on a key issue for a lot of these very large internet commerce sites like eBay and PayPal and, and Taobao. Uh, they want to create uh, frictionless cross-border commerce, but if you actually look at the percentage of e-commerce that is cross-border, it's actually been kind of stuck at about 15 to 20 percent for the last seven or eight years. And the question is, why aren't we seeing more cross-border transactions? And I think a big part of it is a lack of redress. People fear buying things outside of their country because they only know that if they buy from a seller within their particular jurisdiction, uh, that they're going to have redress. So you see a lot of cross-border transactions in low dollar value items or low, low amount, low value items, but not really in high value items yet because there isn't a robust form of redress. So one of the things that we feel very strongly is, particularly for developing economies, it's hard for sellers in Africa or sellers in Southeast Asia to get direct access to consumers in Europe and the United States because of these dynamics. So online dispute resolution is a key means of reducing that friction. And, in, and accelerating cross-border commerce for higher dollar value items because consumers can trust that if a problem arises, it's going to be able to be resolved. And I think that's why governments okay. are investing so heavily in this. Um, you know, the EU has estimated that cross-border consumer problems accounts for more than 25 billion euros of loss for consumers in the EU alone. So I think we're talking about billions and billions of dollars and euros and, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, harms to consumers around the world. And just... Um, hundreds of millions of bad buyer experiences. So that's one of the reasons why I think you see consumer protection authorities, governments, international institutions are all investing their time and energy into ODR because they know we've got to solve this problem if we're going to continue to enable the growth of global e-commerce. Right. Thank you very much, Colin. Um, so if I can ask people uh, for some questions to Colin, I'd particularly like to know from the group any concerns people might have about issues like trust, privacy, 
confidentiality and standards of, and regulation of providers, who you're dealing with, where the data is being held. Uh, uh, does anybody have any questions that they've, and concerns that may come to light about this? Put your hand up if you uh, want to ask a question. No, we don't have any. But if I can just, <laughs> we just say to ask Colin the um, binding, um, the issues about binding and non-binding, which I understand uh, is troubling Uncitrol at the present time. How how do you see that? Um, what would you like to to set out as uh, as rules in that respect? I mean, should this be totally non-binding for all parties, or should traders be required sure. to accept if a, if a consumer wants to use Odeal? Well, I think uh, my personal opinion is that for different types of disputes, there should be different levels of binding and non-binding redress available. Uh, there are many disputes where it's not appropriate to bring in a judge and render a decision because fundamentally it's a relationship dispute between two parties, so it should be up to them to figure out how to solve it. Um, and then there are some disputes where it's fine to have private redress where you don't need to deliver a, a decision that's enforceable in a court of law. But Uncitral has been very has been very hamstrung by this notion of uh, should online dispute resolution be able to deliver um, binding outcomes that are enforceable in a court of law, much like a, a private arbitration decision is enforceable under the New York Convention. So I, there's a lot of controversy right now in the United States because we, we do have legal pre-dispute binding consumer question. arbitration, and a lot of consumer groups aren't happy with that. Now, in, in Canada and Latin America and, and in Europe, uh, pre-dispute binding consumer arbitration is illegal. So I think that as we deal with these different issues of jurisdiction, it's inevitable that we're going to have some controversy. Right. But right. the beauty of online dispute resolution is we can let a thousand flowers bloom. We can build systems that are that are in line with the cultural expectations of each region, and those systems can interoperate. So my opinion is the majority of these ODR systems should be non-binding and or private enforcement only. But there may be some circumstances under which a binding arbitration process is okay for these online transactions. But Thank you very we're much. we're going to have to figure that out moving forward. Thank you, Colin. We have a question there. Where is the um, microphone? Ah. So, Ejoma, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. No, no. Uh, I'm talking to Ejoma. Ejoma. Can you please speak up? Um, no, no. Sorry, but there's a question from the gentleman to your right. Oh, I'm sorry. Because there's also a question <laughs> sorry, from Ejoma as well. Okay. Well, if we ask this gentleman, then Ej, who would be one of our presenters as well. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. My name is Eric Pigal. I'm from the European Economic and Social Committee, specialized on IT security and cloud computing. ODR is a very new subject for me today. I've just discovered that there is such a, a lot of work being done, and it's really fascinating. Um, I have uh, two questions, something which is not clear, uh, and please, my apology for uh, my lack of uh, understanding, but what, uh, which kind of authority uh, is there for enforcement whenever it's required when mediation or negotiation is not uh, a solution? This is my first question. The second one, as I said, I'm specialized on cloud computing. And of course, in cloud computing, we are talking of online, not e-commerce, but online contracts uh, between the cloud provider and the, the users. Uh, is ODR uh, um, an alternative uh, or solution to uh, fix the big issue in cloud computing, which is uh, um, where, where, what is going to be the jurisdiction in case of a conflict between the users and the provider? What is going to be the, uh, the law? And so on and so forth. So we are talking about a global world as well, not for e-commerce transactions, but for contracts. So. Those are my two questions. Colin. Great. Uh, I actually, I heard the first question, and uh, it does get to enforcement, and I can respond to that. I didn't really hear the, the second question that clearly. I, I know it has something to do with jurisdiction. So, Graham, maybe you can repeat the second question? Um, um, sorry, I'll ask the question. Yes, um, again, um, what you have been describing about ODR is mostly on e-commerce. 
yeah. I'm working on cloud computing. With cloud I computing, see. like for e-commerce, we have um, uh, actors, users on one side, providers on sure. the other side, data centers and so on and so forth, and they are global. Yeah? You can have a, a cloud provider in India and being in France or in America. Uh, and of course, there are contracts in between, so we are talking about uh, soft law in, in those or private law in, in, in between them. Um, and they might, there are some potential disputes between the users and the providers. Is ODR, yeah. to your opinion, an, a, so a possible solution for this kind of conflicts that is a big issue in cloud computing? Absolutely. Okay, now I got it. I heard about cloud computing, so thank you very much. Uh, so the first question, you know, it's, it's an interesting question about enforcement. You know, how do we make these, these uh, outcomes matter? Now, there are some circumstances under which, like uh, as I mentioned, we can deliver um, uh, online arbitration awards that abide by the strictures of the New York Convention, which is a treaty that essentially allows for cross-border enforcement of arbitration awards, per provided that those arbitration awards meet certain procedural requirements. And we have built a system that can do that. Um, so I think that there, there are some circumstances where ODR can deliver legally binding decisions that can be enforced in any court around the world. Essentially, it's a signatory to the, OD to the New York Convention, which is the majority of developed countries. But what we did at eBay and PayPal and what ICANN has done and what I think many of the most uh, effective ODR mechanisms have done is they don't rely on legal enforceability. They essentially have private enforcement schemes. So any user at eBay, when they register on the site, they agree to the terms and conditions of eBay. And at that point, in the terms and conditions, eBay lays out, if you have a dispute over an item that is purchased or a payment or a piece of feedback or intellectual property, um, that is going to be resolved by the eBay online dispute resolution system, and eBay will enforce that outcome. Now, that's appealable in a court of law, and eBay's decision is not uh, a court decision. It's not uh, enforceable as an arbitration award is. But what we find in 99.99% of these cases is that private, that private adjudication is adequate for the parties because you're talking about a relatively low dollar value transaction. And I think that's true in payment mechanisms too. If you look at credit card chargebacks, uh, those also are a private enforcement mechanism. They are not delivering a legally enforceable outcome. So I think that that legal standard may be a bridge too far for many of these consumer type transactions, these high volume, low value transactions. Now let's get to cloud computing. Now cloud computing is a very interesting issue because you do have servers all over the world that are interacting and providing data seamlessly to each other and disputes can arise, particularly if there's a data breach or if there's a performance issue uh, or one server is supposed to perform one function and it doesn't do it and some of the other servers encounter problems as a result of that. So I actually think what would happen in those agreements, ideally, is that all of those contracts would specify an online resolution, an online dispute resolution service provider that would be up to speed, would understand the issues around cloud computing, and it wouldn't matter where the server was located. So long as that process was specified in the contractual language, then all of the parties would agree that any dispute would be resolved by that forum. Now, I think that the, that forum, as I mentioned, could be legally enforceable or not legally enforceable, but if you were to create an online arbitration mechanism that had its own rules, separate and apart from whatever uh, legal jurisdictions the servers happen to reside in, wherever the issue was. I mean, I know at Modria we host all of our uh, software on Amazon servers. So Amazon spread all over the world. I don't even know what server is serving a particular page to an individual user uh, because we are, we're spread across multiple servers. So again, that's the reason why mechanisms like online dispute resolution are a much better fit with a newly networked world. ODR works the way the internet works. It doesn't matter where the server is located. It doesn't matter where the dispute is. You specify in the contract the resolution mechanism and the rules that govern that transaction, and all of those rules are global. So I would like to see the expansion of online dispute resolution mechanisms that could target not only e-commerce transactions, as we mentioned, but also the kinds of commercial disputes that arise in cloud computing. And then I think over time, that entire industry in cloud computing would start to specify those redress mechanisms in their contracts because it's the only efficient way to deal with those problems. So I, it's an excellent question, and I'd love to talk further with you about it. You can see my email there on the screen. If you'd, if you'd like to talk more, I, I, I would love to do so. It's, 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 a, it's an excellent topic, and thank you right. for asking the question. Thank, thank you very much, Colin, and, and an excellent reply as well. So, I mean, basically, there is all that flexibility. One looks at the particular type of disputes that you're talking about and also the, the various needs, whatever. Can we move, move, is there any more questions for Colin before we? 
No, oh, thank you very much, for Colin, uh, for coming on and, and giving an, an excellent presentation. Thank you. And, and stick around if you want to trip in for any of the discussion, if we have time for it. I'm going to now bring in a, a, change of sub, a change here and showing the breadth of ODR. Uh, Professor John Zelesnikov. Um, is John online? Um, Professor Zelez Zelesnikov uh, is a, an international recognized expert over 30 years' research experience on uh, negotiation, decision support, and machine learning in, in law. Um, uh, and he's a professor in the, in the uh, University of Victoria in Australia. And he's been doing a lot of work with um, Relationship Australia, I know, on ODR and technology within various disputes uh, in family disputes. Uh, John, are you online? Yes, I am, Graham. Um, lovely to hear you. Good we morning. Can't we can't see your face or picture. I don't I know whether you have to myself, press it. So I'm not, too, I'm, sh I'm not well, too sure what's wrong. Well, you're looking in the mirror then, I think, John. No, I'm <laughs> not. There's a button, at the maybe that doesn't. It will be a great sadness if we can't see you, John. But no, well, I'm now stopping my video and I'm now going to turn it back on. Okay. We can see the first slide. Right, okay, I can, I can well, Why don't I'm a bit surprised you can. Yeah, I think anyway, okay. The, don't matter, if you just uh, carry on, we can see the slides anyway. And, okay, uh, well, I was going to say good morning to uh, uh, the conference attendees in Baku. Uh, my mother spent four years there from 1940 to 1944, and it would have been interesting to... Uh, uh, to come and see the difference, but unfortunately it was a bit too difficult. A very good morning to Alberto, where I gather it's just before three o'clock, and good evening to Colin, whereas uh, I'm actually late afternoon on a beautiful summer day, and that's one of the real benefits of online dispute resolution, of online governments, and our ability to discuss. Now, I'm particularly interested in developing systems that have people mediate, negotiate better. And as Graham said, uh, most of my research has come in the area of family law simply because that's where we received interest in data. So much so, for example, that my wife has now become a family mediator. But one of the things that we've found, and which I will talk about in detail, uh, in uh, working in the area of family law is that you have to worry not only about interests, which has the, been the prime focus of negotiation support systems, but also about fairness. I should also say, and I haven't talked about family law in the overheads, but uh, in Australia, particularly with relationships Australia-Queensland and uh, in British Columbia, there have been some incredibly good systems for supporting online family dispute resolution, which I think are going to have a lot uh, of application to areas other than family disputes. Now, if you go back in negotiation theory uh, and you uh, look at Uriadel, they say disputants can choose to focus on several different approaches to negotiation, interests, rights, or power. The major thing that we've looked at is interests, where the parties try to learn each other's underlying needs, desires and concerns and find ways of reconciling them in the construction of an agreement. Interests are uh, what the Harvard Program on Negotiation and most other negotiation theorists look at because they provide the opportunity for learning about the party's common concerns priorities and preferences which are necessary for the construction of an integrative or mutually beneficial agreement that creates values for all the parties. Whereas if you focus on rights, and uh, we've been talking about binding and non-binding agreements, uh, and then you're looking more at law. And when you focus on uh, rights, you try to determine how to resolve a dispute by applying some standard of fairness contract or law. A rights focus leads to a distributive agreement where one party is likely to win and the other lose, or a compromise that does not realise potential integrative gains. And I have written that, in fact, a rights focus can, in fact, 
lead to a lose-lose situation where both parties lose, uh, particularly given the costs uh, of conducting such a conflict. Focusing on power means that the parties try to coerce each other into making concessions that each would not otherwise permit. Now, a power focus also leads to a distributive agreement and potentially can result in a desire for revenge or the creation of future disputes. And the real problem with the rights-based approach is that, in fact, negotiations don't endure. Dan Druckmann's done lots of research on that. And why spend a lot of uh, effort in, tr in a negotiation that eventually gets broken? And that's your real risk with a rights-based approach. So let's focus on interest-based negotiation. And we've actually uh, done lots of uh, research on building an interest-based uh, negotiation system called Family Winner, which you'll, you'll notice uh, is listed there, uh, Amelia Bellucci and myself. But it's got some sil similarity to other systems and earlier systems, uh, uh, Steve Brams and Alan Taylor's Adjusted Winner algorithm and Ernie Thiessen's Smart System smart settle system and uh, they focus upon the interests of the disputants rather than any objective legal measures of fairness. Now the algorithms particularly devoted by Brams and Taylor are fair in the sense that each disputant's desire is equally met but that's all you're doing you're looking at trying to meet uh, the interests equally. It can be argued that they do not meet problems about justice. And we found uh, this out, but it is generalizable to other areas when we constructed some systems for our industry partner, Relationships Australia and Queensland. It was formerly just a counselling organisation, but now it's an organisation involved in trying to mediate family disputes. And we built them a system and they rather liked it, but they said, your system only looks about the interests of the, uh, of the parents, not about the idea of justice or fairness. And in Australia, the notion of fairness uh, for families means the paramount interests uh, of the children. Now, when I use the word fairness, I actually notice, and I've had some conflict with people like Steve Brams, because he, his argument is a fair system is one that meets everybody's interests equally. Whereas I would argue that a fair system is one that is legally just. And meeting uh, each, each party's interests equally may not be a good idea when one of the parties is particularly unreasonable or where you've got a dispute about children where the two parents are only interested in their uh, benefiting themselves rather than the children. And in saying that, I ought to say that we have very different standards in Australia than, for example, in the United States. Because in Australia, the only thing we worry about are the paramount interests of the child, whereas, for example, in the United States, biological parents do have certain inherent rights which they don't have in Australia. Okay. Sorry, John, can I just... Um Cut in here. Yeah. I, hope to be, uh, I don't want to be, sound a bit too rude. We are, uh, because we got off to a late start, running a bit late and time is tight. I'm particularly interested okay. uh, to look at and for you to talk and explain about the, um, the system. You mentioned family winner, asset divider, okay. and how it's using well, gamesmanship okay. in uh, achieving yep, the aims that I you've will. been talking about. Yep, I'll, okay, I'll quickly get on to that. Okay, yeah. so I've talked about fairness in Australian family law. Uh, and just, just to say about interest and justice before I do get on the example, one lesson learned from the evaluation of family law disputes is the compromises might conflict with law and justice. How do you do that? How do you make sure, uh, and this is the problem if you had uh, some binding resolution, how do you make sure that the advice suggested is in fact fair? Well, Relationships Australia wanted us to construct a system where family dispute resolution practitioners could bias a system towards 
the parent who might have the primary care of the children so that you take in justice as well. Now, one of, the, one of the things we did, and you can now see three slides. Uh, the initial system we built, Family Winner, asked people to input their interests and to give some sort of value to how important each of the interests were. Initially, we asked for percentages, but uh, our newer version has linguistic variables, which then get converted into percentages. Those, uh, those scores are then uh, normalised to 100, and the goal is to give each parent an equal number. And normally, for example, each parent gets about 75% of what they want. Uh, if you're really interested in the system, uh, CNN's money program uh, had a... Uh, a version of the system running, and in fact, on this Jollis versus Jollis dispute, which would take some time to explain, uh, but you can see it there in more detail. But as you can see, and this was a real dispute uh, in New York, where parent, party A and party B, the husband and the wife, were asked to put in what were the issues in dispute and the value of those issues. Uh, so you, you can see uh, the, we had previously how much each issue was worth, and here the parties have different values. If they don't sum to 100, then the system normalises that, and then you'll notice in the second uh, uh, part of the table, it gives an allocation summary uh, where certain items are awarded to party A and certain to party B with the ideas of getting equality. Now, the, uh, what we then did was uh, we can in fact bias it and uh, if you're going to have a look at our papers, you can say if, let's say, uh, the wife is going to have to, she's not going to be able to work because one of the children uh, has some health issues that's going to require her to be at home all of the time, then, in fact, we can, in fact, say to the system, and that's one of the concepts of justice, the family dispute resolution practitioner says the wife is to get 60% of the property. What the system can also do, which previous systems don't do, and you'll see here is that there is a payout to the husband of $170,000 because the wife uh, is getting the, uh, the apartment, which is the most valuable item. And th this often happens that, you know, one of the uh, people... Uh, one of the parties and the children live in the apartment and the, the apartment's most valuable and so there's going to be a cash payout. So the system uh, does that as well. Uh, so okay. by allowing for, you know, for entering that you don't get a 50-50 split and by allowing for cash payouts, we're enhancing uh, the uh, functionality of the decision support system to help the uh, dispute resolution practitioner mediate uh, the dispute. Uh, so in this case, we can see that both parties wanted the Paris apartment above all else. As a consequence, both parties gave the rest of the items relatively uh, low values. On the whole, both parties received the items they valued considerably, except you know, the Paris apartment. The only item valued equally by the parties was the profit sharing plan, and it was given to party B because party A was getting the house. So whilst the original system family winner promoted integrative or win-win rather than adversarial win-lose solutions and is conducted through processes that are fair and perceived by the parties to be, to be fair, uh, our partner wanted the need to comply with prevailing ethical and legal principles the prevention of further conflict and the promotion of collaborative problem solving between the parties. So that's why we built uh, this new system that I've just talked about, Asset Divider, uh, and we've got a new methodology and software to better represent the needs of the family mediation sector. The problem is when you move away from uh, merely interest to needs, uh, then each system is going to be different depending upon the domain. Uh, John, can I just uh, interject yeah. again? If, uh, uh, um, 
I'm not quite sure how, how many more slides there are. I did have a... I think this uh, is it. I know that uh, Alberto in Buenos Aires, it's getting rather late for him there, three in the morning right now. And yeah. uh, I wonder if we can bring Alberto in. Oh, you're okay. I, I'd yeah. just like to ask one question and then open it up if anyone has one to put to you. Um, it's, um, I think this is a fascinating uh, initiative uh, in ODR and uh, how it uh, helps people to focus on their real needs, as I said in introduction, rather than, um, as we know in family disputes, um, people argue as much for the spouse to not get what he or she wants as much as they argue for what they want. And using this right. gamesmanship, they, they have to really focus on their own needs. I'm just one wondering how you feel that in use, that in time, um, whether there's any risk of unfairness in that people who become, like in any game, more skilled at playing the game, if you like, whether whether strategies may arise um, and how one avoids that and keeps it a fair and balanced. Uh, well, okay, uh, two things. First of all, if you're looking... Uh, from the point of view, uh, each of the parties has got to indicate their interests, and their interests are going to be met equally to the other parties. If, in fact, they wrongly indicate their interests, then, in fact, they won't get what they want. They may hurt the other party, and if that's their goal, they may achieve that. There's, there's, there's that one concern, but the... And this would be a real concern if we were talking about a dispute resolution process that was enforced on someone. But if, if you do have, first of all, if you have the process voluntary and if you require the certification uh, of a dispute resolution practitioner that the process has been fair, then I think to some degree you overcome that. And this is sort of the issue, and mm -hmm. I think it's a really fascinating, important issue, binding versus non-binding agreements. I think non-binding ones where you get some advice and then it's up to the parties to decide whether they like it don't need anywhere near the same sense of strict evaluation and enforcement that a binding agreement would. Uh, At the uh, moment, we've been looking at non-binding agreements. Thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your contributions. Anybody uh, got any questions for, J for John before he... No. Well, thank you very much for, uh, for contributing, John. And uh, if we now like to move to Alberto, if he's still awake, Alberto, in Buenos Aires. Alberto Elisavetsky is Director of the Dispute Resolution Center Training and Services at the Universidad Tecnologica Nacional the Faculty Re Region in Buenos Aires uh, at the University of Argentina. Uh, he's a certified public accountant, integration technology consultant, and e-learning specialist, uh, and has, I know, uh, uh, an interest and involvement in uh, both uh, in teaching and in uh, developing on systems and solutions in ODR. Uh, we can see you, Alberto. Good morning to you <laughs> and we have your slide thank you take it away we can't hear you though now ah now we can <laughs> okay thank you graham let me uh, make a small correction now is 3 30 a.m oh <laughs> <laughs> you might as well stay up <laughs> get, okay. get the coffee on okay <laughs> you, 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 you will pay me a coffee next uh, we meet. next time in, in England, okay? My pleasure. Okay, um, thank you very much for uh, give us the opportunity to participate, uh, and I know that you are very uh, short of time. Then my presentation uh, will be no more than ten minutes. Um, hello to everybody there in Baku. Um, my presentation I think, I think if I can just uh, cut in there, it's a bit unfair of me to, to say that, but I know I think I'm looking for a guide uh, as to how long we do have here, because we are actually running, there is a break we can take on, but the, we may only have about 15 minutes, I think, at most, and we we do have okay, two, okay, two okay, other no speakers. With, with, thank you. With 10 minutes, uh, with if you can do it in five. <laughs> thank you. Go okay. on. No, I need six. 
Uh, um, um, five and a half is a deal. <laughs> okay, bye. Uh, you are dividing. This is distribution. No, uh, okay, what I'm, Get on. Uh, what I'm going to share with you is a much more ac an academic approach uh, related to uh, emer emerging countries. Um, basically because uh, we are running the biggest uh, ODR network in the world. Uh, it's a non-profit uh, social network and uh, we have uh, up to today 2,700 uh, members. Um, we w it's like a Facebook but only regarding ODR, okay? We have 2,700 uh, 2, Spanish speakers from Latin America and Spain working different kind of issues related to uh, online dispute resolution. Just to, to make a long story short, we start working in this in year 2006 with uh, our web blog, Resolución Electrónica Disputas, which means uh, ODR. Then we moved to our social network in 2008, and uh, we started with the Spanish chapter of the Cyber Week, uh, like it was mentioned before by uh, Colin, from uh, year 2007. We just finished the last one, and we have around 450 participants from uh, all Latin America, and we create in our worker, um, network, I'm sorry, the Italian chapter. For the first year, it was a cyber week in Italian, and they have roughly 50 participants. Uh, last year, we have our first regional forum uh, regarding ODR innovation in conflict resolution and uh, tomorrow we will have the second one but uh, I would like to share with you what the situation in emerging countries in emerging countries we face different kind of conflicts we have to uh, attend work with social conflict environmental conflict poverty hungry digital gap our situation is the completely different uh, compared with mature market like US or Europe or maybe Asia Pacific. That's why you will see what we are doing now in order to introduce ODR in the region and in order to give expertise to our mediators or negotiators. We create a new project named Si mediar. Si mediar in Spanish means mediation simulation, distant mediation simulation. And that's the project that uh, we launched uh, this week. As uh, you mentioned before, we have our ODR uh, 2010 in Buenos Aires. You can see mediation, negotiation, ODR, and tango. And those were the sponsors. All the are info and icon help us in order to uh, have our first on-site uh, congress. And uh, as I told you before, we were running the Cyber Week. And for the last two years, we create our own online distance Spanish ADR congress. We call it E. ADR. In Spanish, Marx means uh, RAD, which is Alternative Dispute Resolution. Okay? Because in order to introduce the concept of ADR in Latin America, we have to give the possibility all experts, all uh, conflict operators in Alternative Dispute Resolution should understand that technology could be a tool instead of be a different uh, field. Okay. Could I just ask you there? I think we have, we have run out of time. We, we want to get. Uh, w uh, uh, we still have another speaker, speakers here to come in. If I can just ask you, Alberto, you mentioned very, uh, very important differences in what um, in the conflicts and the issues in 
in emerging countries and in the uh, that apply. Uh, do you see different um, formats then that are required for uh, um, for ODR? Uh, very very briefly in in one minute is if we yeah, can just look on the practical minute. side of it. I'm we know that. Three pictures, and I, I leave you. But first year we were we start talking all the Arab social conflict. You can see here, mm. 2011. We have uh, a lot of people working on that social conflict. Last year was the war. You can see here Guernica and Picasso. Okay, and next year will be uh, hungry and poverty. That's the way that we are merging technology with the social conflict on the problem that we have in the region. Okay, if I give you here some figures, you have in the world 34% of penetration of internet users. In Latin America, we have 42%, but the gap is very, very big, and people who have access to internet don't care about huge or big software platforms. That's why we move to uh, a social conflict observatory where we are working in intrafamiliar conflict observation with the technology. We have volunteers from different, uh, 20 volunteers for different Latin American countries. Right. We create an ODR Latin America Academy and we have our first group of 75 students and we launched the CMEDIA project, which is uh, supported by uh, 14 universities to hold the region. And thank you very Pablo much. Lavide, yeah. Spain. I'm going to have to get it. Uh, thank you very much. And the last, uh, before yeah. you throw me out, well, <laughs> that's the platform that we are using. And before the people get bored there, we are using yeah. a, a, a platform which allow us to do uh, real-time mediations, okay? Alberto, I'll have to cut it off at there. Thank you very much. M many apologies for the short time for bye you. Bye. The, you've gone up to two coffees Thank and a you. beer now. But uh, people will, can make contact with them, and I'll give people uh, the details. Clearly a lot happening in South America, and we appreciate you uh, coming on uh, at this late hour and explaining everything. Alberto, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Um, if we've got a few more minutes, I know is Irene... Yeah, we'll just. Are you there, Irene? This is. I just want to ask Irene. Can you hear me? Uh, hello. hello, Irene. Are we not getting through? Hello. 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 Is there yeah. everything fine? Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, we, fantastic. We can hear you, Irene. Um, Good morning, everybody. Yeah, uh, if I can just say that we have um, really running right out of time. I'm going to briefly introduce you. And if you, I don't think we're going to have time for a full presentation, Irene, but if you can just address um, any of the issues that, that we've been discussing. I don't know if you've been listening in. Irene Sig Sigismondi is an attorney at law uh, and contract professor at the University of Rome, La, uh, the Las Sapienza, and Luis Guidi Cali, and uh, has been involved in ODR developments and at conferences. Irene, uh, is there anything um, uh, on the issues that we've been discussed that you wish to address? We'll look at, we've been mentioning a lot about the, the issues of binding or non-binding ODR. Uh, how do you see that in Italy? We have a recent decision by the Constitutional Court which avoided our legislation on a mandatory mediation that was introduced in 2010. But uh, the point is, uh, for a from a legal point of view, that uh, it is not a um, decision by the Constitutional Court which uh, is grounded on basis related on the um, tool itself, mediation as a solution uh, of a dispute tool. But it is based on the fact that the mandatory uh, mediation was a sort of an ultra virus by the government because 
this tool was introduced by a mental decree and not by a regular statute by the parliament. Can you see the point? Is It, it is a subtle difference. Therefore, mm. if the parliament states again and says that it should be mandatory, then it will be without any problem. But the point is, our legislation was ultra-virus uh, according to the principles and criteria that were set by the delegation in the parliament. Can I ask you, Irene, uh, just to clarify to, to the audience here, that uh, Irene is talking about this um, the development uh, to impose mandatory mediation in certain cases in Italy. There's been, I think it was over the last week or the last couple of weeks, a decision of the Constitutional yeah, Court sure. making it, uh, reversing that and saying it was unconstitutional. Um, the impact, obviously, mandatory mediation, more mediation, online mediation has an obvious role to help deliver greater increases in mediation. That's certainly something going to be happening in the UK. Um, do, you, do you think, without going into the, um, the, the, the legalities of the decision and whether it will be reversed again or whatever, but do you see this um, as, as being a, a negative impact on the development of ODR in, in, in Italy or, or, um, or not? Well, the impact has been negative. But as I said, for mm. the lawyers, for an attorney's perspective, this can be easier by a new legislation on this point. So it is not unconstitutional because it is against the jurisdiction uh, principle. It is not for that particular reason, at least for what, for what we must pass now. But it is a, a decision that was uh, based on the fact that uh, uh, the parliament didn't give the uh, opportunity right. to the government to legislate about mandatoriness. But in any case, the impact was uh, positive on the side of uh, such a uh, okay. uh, uh, okay. positive. I really, I really appreciate because um, it's quite early in the morning again for, for yourself. I think you, uh, for you uh, contributing here, and I must apologise. Very interesting. Uh, I'm Don't worry, it's okay. Yeah, I okay. must apologise because there's such a packed uh, program here at Baku, and they're already getting ready for the next session in this room. So uh, I'm really, and I also have That's to uh, apologise to EJ, uh, our final uh, contributor, for uh, for not having any time really to call upon her for a presentation, but I, uh, I think you've sent it to me, and uh, uh, I will certainly see that this is uh, distributed to people with, with interest in that, E.G. My apologies again. Thank everybody for their contributions, um, and, uh, and uh, once again, and, uh, and thank you for helping out, and goodbye from Baku. Okay. Bye. Okay, that's over. Oh, good. So, did this thing really rushed? I feel sorry for the for the Italian. Because she got no time at all. Greens to use Monday. Oh yeah. yeah.